Welcome to the First Time Facilitator Podcast. Whether you're a first time facilitator or a seasoned pro, listen in for tips and tricks to make a bigger impact at the next workshop you deliver. And now, your host, Leanne Hughes. Hello, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Leanne Hughes, and I'm here to help you design fast, deliver strong without the stress. Today, I'm joined by Lisa Leong, who is a broadcaster, author, and facilitator. Her superpowers, which you'll be able to hear very clearly in this episode, are curiosity, creativity, and delivering key messages by way of song. She's a former IP technology and wine lawyer. Yes, there is such a thing. And she caught the radio bug in 2001. That's why I brought her on the show, was to really talk about the parallels between having talk back radio and getting listeners calling in to hosting workshops and being really present. We also talk about energy and meeting the room where it's at and also the best ways to prepare to be spontaneous. Isn't that an awesome oxymoron? And Lisa shares how she does this even down to the detail, like her unique research approach, which includes a bit of LinkedIn stalking. <laughs> Lisa draws on her unique experiences combined with design thinking and mindfulness practices to bring a fresh approach to conversations and connection. She presents Sundays on ABC Radio Melbourne and also hosts This Working Life on ABC Radio National, which is an awesome show. I'll link to all of Lisa's contact details in the show notes for this one, which you can find over at firsttimefacilitator.com. If you like the episode, make sure you share the love and reach out to Lisa, connect with her on LinkedIn and all the platforms. And I love hearing it too. You can tag me on all the socials at Leanne Hughes. Now onto the show. I am so, so, so excited to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, Lisa Leong. Lisa, it's so great to have you here today. So excited. I'm beside myself because I really want to nerd out with you on this episode. Let's do it. Look, Lisa, I know your voice really well. A lot of Australian listeners will know your voice. But for those that are listening globally, uh, I'd love you to just tell the story of how you got the role that you do today, the, the work that you do, what you're really curious about as well. I would call myself as having now a portfolio career, which is sort of many strings to your bow. And I love this term. It was introduced to me from Dory Clark, who's this amazing coach and also a keynote speaker. And What it is, is just these different elements of yourself that as a whole make up a full time. So at the moment, I am a facilitator of workshops and offsites. That's part of my, the strings to my bow. I'm also a presenter on ABC radio. So I have two shows. One's called This Working Life. It's broadcast and then it's a podcast. And then I have a weekly show on Sunday mornings on ABC radio. And so that's live with callers and it's always moving and it's quite frantic and fun is the way I would put it. They're the sort of main things that I do. And I do a little bit of emceeing as well and a little bit of keynote speaking. The main thing was that I was a lawyer. So I was a lawyer for seven years, a corporate lawyer, and then I changed to become a radio presenter. And I would say that through time, thinking or reflecting on your question, I have realized that I am a listener. I'm a listener and I'm curious. And so I think that naturally lends me to the facilitation work. But I actually started off naturally being a keynote speaker. And this is this really watershed moment for me, Leanne, and what I want to say to first-time facilitators as well. So I hated the thought of facilitation. I was petrified. As a keynote speaker, you just talk and nobody can talk back. (laughs) It's so great. You know, so I, and I think I was doing that because, you know, I was a performer and I loved it so much and that is what I thought I was. And so when I was invited to facilitate by my friend Tristan, I was like, no, thanks. (laughs) Yep. Because I said, I don't want people to have a chance to question me because I was scared, Leanne. Underpinning the whole thing was a nervousness that, you know, maybe imposter syndrome is what you might call it, but I didn't think that if somebody questioned me, I'd be like, oh, no, my cover's blown. I don't actually know what I'm talking about. And, you know, I was also facilitating in law firms where critical thinking, I mean, you know, asking great questions is part of the psyche. So of course I was getting tricky questions. So it wasn't completely neurotic to think that if I got up and facilitated that the lawyers would eat me alive (laughs) if I didn't know what I was doing. So it wasn't like silly of me. Mm -hmm. Now, Tristan really helped me out because he said, you know, where are you comfortable? You're comfortable listening and you're really good at taking calls, like, you know, the callers when they call in. And he goes, Imagine if you saw this room, 
like a whole bunch of callers and people who have interesting stories. And what if you brought curiosity and sort of took them like calls? Oh. And can I just say, Leanne, that completely changed the game for me. Just that little mindset shift of looking at your superpowers and really looking at that block, going deep on the block. And then, and also because the questions aren't about me, of course not. And so I think the biggest lesson as a facilitator is it's not about you at all. It's about the people in the room and facilitating being that um, energy safe container creator. And that's totally who I am now. Like I'm way more about other people than I am about myself. And I think that helps. That's incredible. And I, I see myself in your story as well. Like I, I think uh, things I said yes to facilitating, but I didn't really take it as a facilitation. So a lot of my run sheets, I kind of joke on the show. It's like 9, 10 a.m. Say this, 9, 11. It was like the precision, no space for conversation at all. It's just hideous. Were you, know, you facilitating by yourself at first? Leanne, yeah, I was. Uh, so I was facilitating with Tristan and we wrote down every line. And at one point I got angry with him in our fir- one of our first workshops and I said, you stole my line. That was like my joke and you stole it. And then I thought, hang on, I think this has gone too far. And I think, I mean, I had um, MBS on the show and he talks about sort of lazy facilitation. And I feel like the graduation from a, like from a first time facilitator is like the, the control, the script, the jokes that you're taking from each other. And then when you graduate, you're actually becoming lazier and more loose, which is kind of counterintuitive. So I do have a phrase for that and I use it. It's in, it's a, phrase that I developed and learnt through radio, but it's prepare to be spontaneous. So we do so much preparation, really. I mean, I prepare a lot for this work in life and for my Sunday shows and for everything that I do, but then you hold it lightly in that moment. And that is definitely a confidence and experience thing, but it's also that reminder that this is not about you and so you can let it go and you need to have all of your senses open to what is happening in the room and how are people coming into this. And I think it's such an important point about understanding the energy of the people in the room and that you're facilitating for all types. Mm -hmm. So I specifically don't facilitate or just extroverts, because, you know, I know that your interest, how do you engage people and get the interaction going? And my thing is to really start with where the room is starting. It's really powerful. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to go to that question, but I do want to sort of back to the radio thing. I think I would love to pull that thread as well, because one of the, when I was sort of teaching a lot about virtual facilitation back in 2020, when everyone's moving virtual, no one knows what the heck is going on. One of the analogies I used to use, and I had to explain it with global audiences, was School of the Air. You know how a School of the Air in Australia, and I I think because everyone was like, everyone must be on video. They must be on video, otherwise they're not engaged. And I was like, well, the fact is you can teach people all around remote Australia just through the power of voice. Plus Mm -hmm. you've got supporting materials and, and you can facilitate conversations that way. I'm curious with you and your ability, because it's a superpower, it might be hard to explain, but because you're so good at taking those calls and sort of being spontaneous with the person on the call. How do you manage that? Like what, what is it in terms of the listening and the being present that really sort of resonates with you and, and makes that a real superpower for you, being able to respond? Well, I did get really sick about a decade ago and I got shingles and then I got post neuralgia, which is like this secondary nerve damage, which is just debilitating, just to try and deal with the pain because it was quite shocking. I started doing John Kabat-Zinn's eight-week mindfulness for stress reduction program. I promise you this is going somewhere, which at the time I was like, I don't really, I'd never wanted to do mindfulness because I thought it was like, why would you sit there doing nothing? You've got to waste of time. (laughs) Anyway, it was really challenging. But the thing I learned and took away the most, Leanne, was being present absolutely in that moment for other people. And I think it really changed who I was as a person who I am. And also it unlocked a lot of the interactions that I have with others, particularly things like radio, where you do need to be hundred percent listening in that moment and being there for another person. And so I think for me, it's just the mindfulness practice, Mm. taking it as it comes and not getting in the way of it. So don't really have nerves because if it's all about the other people, then, you know, it's got nothing to do with me. 
And if I'm picking up something from someone, I'm curious about that because I don't really know them often. And so, you know, bringing genuine curiosity to what is happening for them, that's kind of important for me. So I would say just mindfulness and, and, and bringing that presence and reminding yourself to be present. Yeah, that's great. I think particularly when I think it's that live environment, everyone thinks, well, if I, if I'm being present, I've still got to figure out where this is going. And so your mind's sort of like in this space, like with facilitation, you want to, a client comes to you and says, we want to get this outcome. And you're in the space where it's like, I can't see this going anywhere. And so there's all this traffic going on internally. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a a couple of things which are funny because like when on radio, of course, you have a producer and the producer is often thinking about things and So they write to me or they might even talk in my ear. And so sometimes because I can't multitask, weird things happen. And one of the weirdest things was (laughs) I was broadcasting Standing In for Life Matters, so with a different team, and we were timing up to the news. And, of course, when the ABC News theme comes on, it comes on. And so I had to time up to the news. So that means I just talk right up to the time that the news comes on. And so I was talking and the producer kind of just went into my ear just to, you know, sort of say a few words at the end. But because I can't multitask, they were telling me about the next show that was coming up after Life Matters and they were reminding me to forward promote that show. Unfortunately, the show was called Stop Everything. And so they said in my <laughs> ear, stop everything. And I stopped talking. And like, we weren't up to the news yet. So I stopped talking. And then I thought, stop everything. <laughs> I don't think they actually meant stop it. This is all my head. I thought, gee, that's a lot of dead air that's happened right now. And then I went, up next, stop everything <laughs> over the news. So I completely crashed the news. Yeah. That's hilarious. That was pretty funny though, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be the ultimate challenge. Like you think you're comfortable in facilitation that someone throws like an earpiece and you have to oh, navigate so. all of that, let alone so your own self The equivalent though is your own voice when you're facilitating. I think that, you know, when I was facilitating with another person or when I work with another person, obviously when you get to know them, that helps because you can have that second brain and you can actually say, okay, I'll do the policing of time so that you can watch the room. That helps. If I'm facilitating alone, then I would tend to sort of write notes as well and then, yeah, sort of take a moment. And I take those breaks as well just to – so I'm sort of introverted, extroverted in the sense that just before I come on, I actually take a quiet moment and I just centre myself. And then every break I usually take myself away and just do the same centering. Um, just to think, okay, what did I pick up and where should we get to? But yeah, there is a lot of thinking on your feet, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. And you're right. And I think during the breaks as well, I've heard some facilitators like, I want to be there for the group. So I'll just, they'll just stay in the room. They won't go to the bathroom. They won't grab a coffee. They won't have that self-care. And I think I'm the same as you. Like I just need to breathe and to sort of regather like what is, I kind of set myself up between like 90 minutes, then the break, then I'll set myself up for the next session and look forward depending on what's there. So it, I, I'm with you in terms of needing that sort of just the ability just to breathe and have that time out. Hey, Lisa, what I've noticed from this interview already is that you've used my first name like more often than any other guest I've had (laughs) on the podcast. So, and I've picked that up. Is that a radio skill? Is that a facilitation skill? Is that a Lisa thing? Good question. I I think that is a natural thing that I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go about, you know, in terms of preparing for facilitation. So Generally, if there's less than, say, 20 participants, then I usually ask to meet them. So if we're talking deep facilitation here, so it might be with a leadership team, but I would spend an hour with each participant before the session in the room, depending on the type of facilitation. If it's more than 20, so 100 or 200 or more, I usually actually get the list as well. And I will just do a LinkedIn kind of really quick pass on who is in the room. And I try and look at each person as an absolute human being. So rather than a blob that I'm trying to facilitate or an organization, I'm like, Ooh, who, who are the humans? What have they done? And I love LinkedIn because you can see all the crazy hobbies sometimes and the career paths. I would bring them out. 
So I might say, oh, you lived in Belgium, so did I, or you'd know this. And so, and I would actually say their first names and say, oh, Leanne, I noticed, you know, that you have done this in your past and so have I. And so I think it's being seen. So, you know, a lot of the work of facilitation and creating that safe container is I see you as the human being, the whole human being that you are, and then you are perfect exactly as you are in this moment. And so that trust builds then. And so any of the work that I do is absolutely built for those human beings in the room. So I don't have, I have a few things that tools that I might use, but I often build the first activity depending on who's in the room. Oh, that's incredible. And I love that that level of research is actually, don't you wish you had a producer? Like I wish I now had a workshop producer that could do all that, that groundwork for me. And I, I like that you, you, it's not a collective blob that we're talking to. We're talking to individuals. And I think, I mean, some of the best advice I had on my podcast in the early episodes was as I was like saying, hey, everyone, like I was Taylor Swift at the concert going, hey, everyone, rather than <laughs> talking to an individual. So oh. just that that mindset shift is pretty huge. Oh, I love that. And in radio, so yes, we see it as being intimate and immediate. And part of that intimacy is I would say to a guest, it's you and me and one other person and we're sort of in a cafe and so we're including that third person but generally they are they're not they don't have a voice like they they're not participating but they're really intrigued and so that is the listener and when you think about the way we're listening now which is usually through our phones and in our ears when we're walking or running then it is one on one now so it isn't to thousands actually and that's why yeah, generally on radio, we don't say you all or the listeners anymore. Some people might use it as a technique, but generally we're trying to be more immediate and intimate. And nowadays I would say to people, you. So instead of saying this morning, we are learning about whatever we're learning about, I would say, do you have an envelope, you know, is stuck in your drawers and it happens to be your superannuation? and you've never opened them this morning, yeah. you and I, we're going to open the superannuation envelope. We're going to have a look at it and you're going to learn how to read it and how to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> Something like that. That's awesome. And you can see that that is sort of more like, oh, yeah, that's true. I do have that. <laughs> or whatever it is. So even though, idea, like, yeah. So, yeah, but like just the way that you captivated attention there, and that was such a great hook. I mean, even in a workshop, that's a beautiful way to craft like an opening if you want to get the attention as well. Lisa, I want to focus on that earlier line around the energy mm-hmm. and meeting people where they're at and talking about introverts in the room. Yeah, I'd just love you just to elaborate on, on what that means for you and what that looks like in a workshop. So I think the danger is to play to extroverts in a big room with lots of people. And so I generally this is true I'm just trying to think I generally shy away from doing yeah any performative work nothing where you're sort of putting somebody on the spot or making them do something or even group work together that is embarrassing or just until you at least build some trust right so at the very least if I'm doing group work or interactive work I get people to do it in pairs at the start Another thing that I've done is that I did some facilitation for an innovation conference for SA Water and it was an amazing day. They have innovation awards in the night and for anyone nominated, and these are people from all over the company. So we're talking people on the field as well for innovation that they have done on maybe doing things in a different way, like building a pipe in a different way. So they had all these people coming for an all-day conference to learn more about innovation. I was emceeing and keynote speaking. And so I asked, "Does I would imagine that people don't know each other. And they said, no, they don't. And they mixed the tables. And so we had people who'd never been to head office. And so I thought, oh, okay. So I built a very low-key but a table kind of interactive activity right at the start for people to introduce themselves and to actually build a sense of trust. And so basically I got them to make, I think this one was say your name and a quirky superpower, like, you know, I can chew and, and sing 
advanced Australia pair at the same time. It's something <laughs> silly, right? Yeah. And then you have to say the person's name and every single person has to say, and it was just this sense and it opened up the room and it became this. And then because we had the tables all rah-rah, you belong here, then, you know, it just created this beautiful sense. Oh, I think I even made them like do a <laughs> five or something. So, you know, you had to go around and you had to look the person in the eye and say, Leanne, you belong here. Woo! Like that. So that one was just like to really try and, and it built the energy because they were all standing around and running around and then then they were table friends. I love it. Uh, and it is true. I mean, I, I ran a conference and because I think, look, I can be both an extrovert and a bit of an ambivert, obviously, but I do love like meeting new people at conferences, but I also have to have that empathy that other people, that is their worst nightmare. One, one time I was working with a client, they had like 150 people in and it was all about just meeting other people within the business and connecting. And I was like, oh, you know, we might move tables at lunchtime. But I had a conversation with someone at lunch and he's like, look, I, I, I really sort of got to know these people. I really want to stick with them. I'd love to get to know them deeper. And so I actually made the decision not to switch tables because we just worked so hard to even get to that level that we could then yeah. go to sort of deeper questions in the afternoon. But it's hard when you have that sort of you're trying to get a couple of things going for a client, but, you you know, the qualitative relationship versus you know, having the amount in terms of quantity is probably, it was probably better in that situation. And I love the fact that you had something in your mind, but then you picked up something and then you went, you know what, I think I'm just going to adjust what I had initially thought. And I think that takes a lot of confidence and experience, but also that is the work of the facilitator, I think, to redesign things if they need to be redesigned absolutely in the moment. Yeah. And you spoke about, I mean, at the end of that day, because I think we are so present, it can be pretty draining. Like I, I get pretty exhausted at the end of a day of facilitation. It's so draining, Leanne. And okay. the hilarious thing is that because a lot of my work is, it's deep, right? But it's always fun. So I always try and for some reason, it's like levity. There's a levity because I think take it seriously, don't take yourself seriously. I have had people come up and go, oh, wow, it must be like not working at all when you can, you know, have fun all the time facilitating these two-day <laughs> off-sites. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> At least been like gone. Just how do you- So I don't go out in the night. I just yeah. am I have to just curl up in a ball. And I'm the same. I feel really bad of clients like, oh, we're going out to dinner. And I'm like, I just can't. Like, thank you so much for the invite. But like, I always want to be in bed at 7.30 and get some eight hours of sleep because, and plus your mind's sort of just thinking about what do I do the next day? So I'm curious, like in the lead up, you mentioned, you know, right before a workshop starts, you'll get centered and get present. What about in the preparation for a workshop? So you spoke about going on LinkedIn and, and finding out mm. who's in the room. Questions you ask clients, like how much do you scope? How much like preparation time do you give yourself? Oh, quite a lot, I would say. And when I take something on, so I'll schedule in. So I have a Google calendar, which I call my single source of truth. And so it's scheduled in all the prep that I do as well so that I can also monitor how much prep time am I taking. And it's a lot. And so early on, it's the conversations really with the stakeholders. So there's obviously the leader, maybe the leader's team, and then sometimes with the participants as well, not to ask them what they want from the workshop. It's to get to know them, build empathy, and then I design the workshop with the needs in mind. One of the great reorientations that I learned from Colin James, Mastering Communications, was to ask, how do I want the audience to feel? What would I like them to think and do or know as a result of this workshop? And so that becomes the North Star really for building and designing. And that's the questioning that I'm really focused on when I'm meeting the stakeholders. So, you know, whether it be the problem we're trying to solve, but actually how do we want, you know, what is the energy of each of the individuals now that we're picking up? Yeah. Where do we want them to be at the end and what we're trying to do? And then then I'm kind of co-designing is the way I see it. So I'm co-designing the workshop. I bring my expertise and I match it with the knowledge of the organisation and the people and together we co-design a beautiful offsite together. It is like more like a partnering role, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and that's yeah. fun as well. So 
I have, I think it's always been in my makeup, but a bit of a mantra around enjoy the process. So I'm actually less about the outcomes and really about the process. I believe that if you get the process right and with infuse it with the right intention, then actually the outcome will occur. But if you fixate on the outcome, it just, for some reason, it just falls apart. <laughs> so oh, I'm, I'm so with process. you. So who am I collaborating with? So that's the first choice. I don't collaborate with everyone. I co- collaborate with people I love and who I feel aligned to and I want to succeed. And they're usually people who are oriented to their people, to be honest, mm. and who are really into teaming and getting the best out of people and having people have a great time at work. And so that's the start. And so Every time I'm meeting with them, it's not really a meeting. It's a, you know, it's like playing what I call mind jazz. So that's you have your instrument. I have my instrument. We don't have to play each other's instrument here, but I am tuning in. So attunement, then resonance, and then we play together and we're like, oh, wow, we've just created something that did not exist. And and that's why I don't really have tips and tricks with the actual workshop because I'm like, I don't know what's going to emerge from this one. Yeah. That, that phrase, mind jazz, it, it, that's yeah. what it's like. And it, it's such a creative process, I think, workshop design. Like even to a point where I find it, I, I design my workshops when I'm out walking or with the dogs or on the couch. I don't sit in front of a computer and design a workshop. It's very like just divergent thinking. And I know oh. those situations. And you know you're working with a great client when you're making like great music. It's like, what about this? And there's no sort of barrier or like, oh, we can't do that. It's playing with the idea before converging. So do you then, so you sort of taking the information and then you go for a walk, do you? Is that how you, and then are you writing things down when you're walking? I'll give you a secret. And this is something I haven't really shared with other people, but I I didn't really know it was a thing until I I was caught caught up with another fellow facilitation podcast host, Miriam, last week. And I was telling her my process when I work with clients and it depends on the client and the situation. But if I have permission, what I like to do is if we have a call, like it's a pre-call with each participant, I like to um, to record it and just say, look, this is only for me. Then I have a I have my own private podcast. So it's it's called Stuff Leanne Needs to Listen Back to or Remember. Wow. And I put it on so because what I find, like even when I'm talking to you, I want to take notes, but I also know that I'm not being present. I don't I don't want to take notes during those conversations. So I put it on a private podcast. I'll listen back to it at 1.5, two times the speed, and I'll listen for keywords and themes. And that wow. this just sits in my mind. There's no, I don't write it down, Lisa, it just sits in my mind. And then you know, something will happen and then I'll be like, oh, that's the idea. Like that's the process. So <laughs> that's what Love I do. That. I like it because I'm an audio person and I and uh, Jonah Berger talks about it in his book Contagious. When we're in motion, when we're moving, that's when the ideas flow. So even if I'm driving or walking or running, it's like if I'm in motion with the idea rather than that's sitting down. Uh, yeah, it's quite good. And then when you're designing, what do you use to design usually post-it notes one one idea so I can move them around because it's yeah. it's more of a mind map than it is a linear thing linear doesn't work for me or, or, or for facilitation I think it's and sometimes when I've done even training sessions I've just had ideas on on sort of index cards and I might shift them around depending on what's what's going on do you know I've moved so I was doing post-it notes physical post-it notes and then because of COVID I started using Miro and doing the post-it notes there so you can still move them around what I'm finding really interesting is I can then print them in color and then I'll put them into a book but like I'll just put it I'll stick it into a book and then I'll just carry the book and have my facilitator notes in a notebook and I actually quite like doing that now because because I'm facilitating by myself it's just quite nice to have something that I can hold in my hand and it's quite nice because it's a notebook not you know like just a piece of paper Mm. and it was too hard to carry I used to carry those big you know those big post-it note butcher's paper things yes I do and because I had my facilitation notes there I would have to carry the whole thing and stick it up or we would take pictures of it and then try and re you know like size it into notes no it's no good in the, uh, we got the flip chart Facebook group. We've got, we got like 2,000 facilitators. We geek out on this stuff all the time. Like, how do you transport your flip charts? So I've got yes. like architects, blueprint, oh, tube. Oh, yes, I've got a tube. The tube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even I didn't like, I mean, and how people store their information. Like, I, I, yeah, run sheets on display folders. It's so great just to hear what other people do. And I love that note, 
I mean, I love the colors, first of all. It's like it's a bright notepad that you've got there. So if you're listening to the podcast, we'll throw some screenshots in in the show notes for this. You did did post on LinkedIn that really, I mean, I know you're an awesome person. I love listening to your podcast and radio show, Lisa. You get some wonderful people on there. When we were messaging on LinkedIn, you mentioned Roger Schwartz and his facilitation workshop, which really sort of, I guess, was a watershed for you. Are there any sort of key insights from uh-huh. from him that you wanted to share with listeners on the show. Yeah, okay. I had been sort of facilitating um, for a little while, which was a good thing, I think, because I was sort of getting my head around facilitation and I really wanted to take it to the next level. Roger Schwartz does an amazing program called The Skilled Facilitator. He's in Carolina. I think it's North Carolina. So I went over there to do this course. So this is the book the skilled facilitator. The reason why I love this book is because it talks about our natural inclination when we get stressed and that is a unilateral control approach to life. And the unilateral control approach is I am right and others are wrong. I have information that people don't and it's it's very much this You know, when you get frightened, how you go to a little bit of me versus other, I think. Then he says, actually, what's more purposeful, especially as a facilitator, is a mutual learning approach. The mutual learning approach has these values, which are actually like my core values. And this is why I love it. So it is built on values like compassion. It's built on values. We can co-design this together. And here's another one. Transparency, curiosity, informed choice, accountability, and compassion is the values. Mm -hmm. But then, and so instead of I am right and others are wrong, it's I have information, so do other people. Each of us sees things others don't. People may disagree with me and still have pure motives. I love that one. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good one. Differences are opportunities for learning. I may be contributing to the problem. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so that's the values. Then there's the assumptions. Now, this is why it's gold because he's taken this and that's like nice, but he's turned these into behaviours. So the whole thing that you learn is you go into these small groups and you coach each other. He has specific frameworks that you use, even words that you use in order to bring this to life, particularly when you're facilitating. He goes so deep into what happens in that moment when somebody asks you that question, you know, or when you notice something, how do you intervene on that? What is going on for you in your head? What is flaring up for you? Here's an example and ask genuine questions. So this is the transparency thing. So yes, of course you have a view. So just state it (laughs) and then, but ask a genuine question. What am I missing? Use specific examples and agree on what important words mean. Focus on interests, not positions, and jointly design next steps. So this is all happening when you're facilitating. It's extremely powerful. And I'll give you another example of why it's powerful. And and it's a funny story as well. So there is a framework. It's called the ladder of inference. The There's data, which is the words that you use and I use. That's data. Then I take the data, so you might say a sentence and then suddenly because it's triggered something in me from my past, I'll go up the ladder away from the data and suddenly I'm right up the top where it's really dangerous thinking and getting really annoyed or neurotic or whatever happens by something that you've said. Mm -hmm. And if it's in the workshop, you know you can feel it, like you just get a flash of something and it's like, oh, they're attacking me. So... What you try and do is you're trying to get down the ladder of inference. My example is I was catching up with somebody that I found very hard to overlap, like find the right time. He said that he was going to an event. Um, I didn't know anything about the event, but I was able to gate crash it because it was at my old college, Ormond College. So I gate crashed the event. I didn't really know anyone else, but I was waiting for him and he was kind of late. And so I was milling around, had a glass in my hand and I was just making conversation and uh, a, a group came up to me and then one of the ladies looked at me and she said, are you starting or finishing? And I have a massive thing about looking younger than I am. Mm. Like it's it's a big deal, right? And I'm like, F you. 
Like mm. I, I was at college like a long time ago. Can't believe you're saying that. So of course I went, well, I actually started in 1990 and I finished in 93. I was at college 40 years ago, whatever, 30 years ago. And she kind of looked <laughs> at me and then she promptly just moved away from me right? because <laughs> it was obvious that I was kind of pissed off. And then I was like, God, that was so annoying. And then, and then I saw a friend of mine, Kate. And so Kate came, I haven't seen Kate for ages, right? So, oh, Kate, hi, you know, I didn't know anything about the event. So she said, oh, are you starting or finishing? And I'm like, okay, what is going on? And I go, what is this event, Kate? And she said, oh, this is the prestigious ethical leaders scholarship something program for graduate people graduating and starting and it's like a mega yes honor so can you see the letter so that Absolutely. lady was being very generous yeah that I was an ethical leader until the point when I revealed that I was not <laughs> how right and that's right. an example of the letter because that's my, oh my gosh that's my yeah <laughs> it's so good knowing this as well because sometimes if you're a facilitator and you think you've used a word that might create a reaction like it's really oh my gosh it's all about me but it's like hang on how do we unravel this and take it down yeah that is I mean that your that book that you've talked about has been recommended to me so many times and I still haven't read it but now Lisa I am going to to grab it um and dig in yeah. Very so powerful. there's that and it, and it because it's so practical um you know it'll go through things like you know working with a partner or how to intervene on emotions hello it's just so amazing and then there's like this other field book so there's a oh, skilled great. facilitator field book yeah and so it goes through workshop design oh and the beautiful thing it also talks about practicalities of you know when you're designing and you're like how much time do I need to leave so it goes through all of that and it's way more time than you think <laughs> is the rule isn't it absolutely like, I yeah. just pair it back it's like simplicity is key don't do too many things at once like that was a lesson oh my gosh Oh, the first time I facilitated <laughs> the feedback on the first day, it was so generous of this lady to tell us, but she said it was a bit like mad woman's knitting. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I've we, had that. We, throw, we threw everything in that first day. In, in my book, I always I say I, I had to break the assumption, like more information does not equal more value. Like we have to, information and value are not like in a relationship. You know, sometimes it is the inverse, right? It's the inverse correlation. Like the less actually, the more time you have to play with it, the better. Lisa, you've given so many, so many tips here. I'm wondering if, would you leave any sort of final advice for people that are first time facilitators and starting out their workshop career? I think be aware of what you'll be bringing into it. So, you know, the practice of reflection is really important. So yes, there's the preparation. Yes, there's the doing and just do it, I think is the thing, isn't it? That we're learning and that like a first radio show, you just have to get it done because it won't be perfect. And in fact, you'll look back and go, wow, that was a bit of a train wreck. However, you just have to do it and know that it is data and that from that you will learn more and be really open about that with the people that you're facilitating for as well. If you can work with someone else, that's good because then you've got another person who can give you some reflection points as well. I think that and especially if they're a more experienced facilitator. So I was lucky in that regard. I worked with a number of experienced facilitators and I was just, you know, sort of observing in the second person for a lot of those early workshops until it was a long way down the track until I could figure out really who was I as a designer. Um, and then, yeah, leverage off your superpowers, I think. Uh, do that reflection and then, yeah, just always be learning is the way mm -hmm. I approach things. Yeah, I love it. I think you're so right that the co-facilitator very early on because I think even now, I mean, both you and I are solo facilitators. At the end of the day, like you're kind of reflecting to yourself or reflecting in a journal, where as opposed to when you have a co-facilitator there, you can just get that conversation off your chest in five or ten minutes, you're like back, you know, all right, cool. It's not ruminating in your own mind. So just <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just nice having that yeah. other person there. Yeah. Lisa, you, you do so many things, you wear so many hats. If any listener would like to reach out and get in touch, uh, where can we send them? So I seem to be um, spending the most time on LinkedIn. <laughs> I love it as a, a place to be and to interact. So absolutely reach out to me there and write things and I will reply there. So that's the best place. I think it's Lisa S. Leong 
have my middle name in there, Lisa S. Leong. And then I also am on Instagram. At the moment, I seem to just be posting watercolours that I'm doing. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. So that's Lisa S. Leong and you'll see my watercolours there <laughs> and sometimes a post or two. Wonderful. And we'll link to all that in the show notes and all the books and resources that you mentioned as well on the show. Yes. But it's a my book as well, This Working Life. The oh, book. yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So it's yeah. about how to navigate your career in times of uncertainty. So definitely more individual than we do on the show and has activities and some self-reflection exercises. So that might be helpful as well for people as they're going through this as well. I think so. It'd be um, linked to that as well. Lisa, you're the best. Thanks so much for Yay. sharing your workshop tips. It's been so fun geeking out on Oh, so good. Thanks, Leanne. And <laughs> congratulations on the great work that you do. Oh, thank you. 